It's Tuesday, July 12th, and you're listening to the Beer Temple Podcast. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Welcome to the Beer Temple Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Chris Quinn. I am, as of right now, solo as far as the hosting duties go. Uh, I'm actually completely solo. We don't have Surge. Uh, That's why the fade might have been uh, a little bit subpar. I apologize for that, mostly to Surge, but to all the listeners out there as well. Um, We have... A little bit of a different show today. We're going to be doing what we call our our Hot Take History series. Um, And it's funny, it started out as Mike and I just coming up with what we could gather and then kind of just our mm, thoughts on different styles, the history of them, and how they have kind of come from the origins or what we know of the origins of the style up until contemporary versions and how kind of we can trace a path. Um, and it started out, as I said, as, as a hot take history because it was just kind of me and Mike and what we were able to kind of figure out. And you may have realized that slowly and steadily we have started getting more and more uh, contributions from people who actually know what they're doing. And that is, we're taking a, a pretty big leap in that direction. I don't know how I feel about it, actually having worthwhile information. Uh, I, I guess we'll have to see if you guys like speculation or actual info. I hope you like actual info. But um, we've got a special guest with us all the way from the Netherlands. And it he is a first-time guest. So in typical Beer Temple podcast fashion. We are going to allow him to introduce himself. Um, And uh, with that, uh, Roel, feel free to take it away. Yeah, um, I hope you can can hear me all right. So uh, my name is Roel Mulder. I live in the Netherlands um, and uh, I'm a historian. And uh, one of the uh, many subjects that I find of interest is beer. So um, I've been doing research on beer history now for uh, something like nine years already. Um, So first I delved into the uh, history of the Netherlands, beer history of the Mm -hmm. Netherlands. Um, So in 2017, I published a book on uh, the lost beers of Holland. which is uh, now sold out, and anyway, it was in Dutch, so uh, you <laughs> okay. uh, probably won't be able All to read our, our it. Dutch, our Dutch-speaking audience can uh, go look for that on the secondary market, I guess, yeah. Uh, yes, and um, so when I finished my book on Dutch beer history, I thought, well, what shall I do next with my life? And then I realized that I had, had a lot of questions still about Belgian beer, so uh, that uh, was the next uh, beer subject I concentrated on. Um, and so I uh, write about beer history on my blog, lovebeers.com. I also write for some magazines over here in the Netherlands and occasionally in Belgium and also for uh, the American American Zimagy oh, magazine, yes. mm-hmm. um, where I uh, wrote some articles about lost uh, Belgian beers with uh, old beer recipes and everything. Um, in any case... Um, also on my uh, blog, I have uh, or the occasionally have uh, historical recipes that people can try to brew themselves. I sometimes brew in my own kitchen, uh, certainly not very professionally, and uh, I know my limitations uh, uh, with that. But um, it was a very nice way to try out some old uh, recipes and uh, brew. Uh, be the first person in sometimes over 100 years to brew a certain old beer style that. Uh, 
uh, that I rediscovered. That's amazing. Which was great fun. You occasionally come across really uh, fun old recipes uh, um, with new ideas. They give you can give you new ideas uh, for uh, beers that you can make right now. Um, so we're going to, well, thank you so much, first of all, for, for coming on. I know it's quite late in, in the Netherlands. So we're actually recording this in the middle of the day here in, in Chicago. Uh, we're in the actual, uh, bar right now because it's a little bit quiet, but I apologize in advance. Anyone out there, if they hear any background noise, I almost guarantee you at some point there will be some background noise, but that's totally okay. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, Cezanne farmhouse sales, that that Belgian style uh, primarily. But if you don't mind, uh, uh, Roel, would you I, I'm very curious about um, the relationship stylistically between uh, Dutch beer and and Belgian beer, because I think a lot of what we know of in the craft beer community is um, they're almost uh, uh, one one in the same uh, or or maybe um, I think of Dutch beer as very similar to a certain type of of Belgian beer. But is that historically kind of what was Dutch beer like? I know that's a giant question to kind of throw at you, but. It just was interesting when you were giving that introduction. Yeah, well, um, historically, uh, there certainly have been uh, parallels. Um, and uh, uh, for centuries, uh, uh, you had the same trends and uh, the same kind of uh, recipes that you would get. Um, but especially during the last 200 years, uh, they have diverged a bit because, um, for one thing, uh, Belgians just drank a lot uh, more beer than the Dutch did. Okay. Um, so um, the number of breweries in, in Belgium was uh, just a lot higher than in Holland. And we started having industrial breweries a bit earlier than the Belgians. So in the 19th century, you get like really big industrial breweries like Heineken and uh, Amstel and uh, uh, Gros and that sort of big Dutch breweries that mainly made lager type uh, beers and they just pushed all the traditional beers off the Dutch market. Okay. So uh, by the time after the Second World War, you would only have lagers in Holland. And um, at um, some point in uh, 1980, there were only 15 breweries left in Holland, while in Belgium you would have like 150, 200. Uh, and those 15 breweries in Holland would only make lager. Okay. And it's only for the last 40 years that uh, Dutch brewing culture has really revived, especially also because Dutch people started to look at the Belgian beer culture and they copied uh, a lot of what was going on in Belgium. But the Belgians really have have kept uh, a lot of their beer tradition um, while the Dutch had to rebuild it during the past 40 years. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it... Now that you say it, that that is exactly, I guess, in hindsight, what my perception is, is that I wasn't even thinking of Heineken and Amstel and Grolsch as um, historic Dutch beer. But absolutely, that was my first um, experience with Dutch beer, uh, especially having a, a Dutch grandfather who drank exclusively Heineken. Uh, that was my, I remember that as a kid, uh, always have Heineken at, uh, at grandpapa's house. Um, and he'd make us puffages as well. So we'd have little pancakes. He'd be drinking Heineken's. Um, but, but, um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and, and now it does almost seem like a copy of, of some of the Belgian stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm, I mean, here in the United States, it's great. I mean, um, actually, uh, we can take a, a moment to uh, say hi to uh, our co-host, uh, uh, Mike Shalau. What's Hello. up, Mike? How are you? Um, I'm all right. Uh, dealing with some, uh, some yeah. migraine stuff oh, going I'm on. Sorry. But uh, I'll play through it. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So we were just introducing uh, Roll. Uh, he gave his background as a uh, historian um, and who is kind of a lover of beer. I was just about to say um, that here in the United States, whenever a new historic style is even heard of, whether it's truly actually understood or not, Mike, I think I know where you're going. Uh, somebody just says that, you know, they've uh, nailed it and they almost kind of like reinvent the style sometimes, I feel. Um and uh, so feel free to pass along any of these historic Dutch beers um, to uh, Mike or somebody else. And, and they'll just say, yeah, this is what it's like. Yeah. No, matter how it, no matter how it comes out. Yeah, they were double say, dry hopping back then. Yeah, this is historic. This is exactly how it tasted. Um, and then uh, it's funny. We've seen a couple. I, I harp on uh, this style so much, but it's like Grisette. The style uh, Grisette um, is, I mean, to my from what I can see, uh, one person uh, brewed it, or maybe a few people brewed it, and then now um, there's, like, in the U.S. community, this just understanding that, like, this is Grisette now. And it was like, well, this yeah. is just one person remaking the, the style. Uh, but I, I also think it's kind of fun that, that people are just, hey, it, it's, it's it, living it, again. It, it's, it's, it's all part of, of the beer scene that things like that happen, and just shows you how... Uh, vibrant the whole thing is and uh, how, how, how much people are interested in, in, in trying out new stuff and uh, actually uh, as far as I know Agriset was uh, um, well one of the people that was really um, doing Reset was of course uh, or is perhaps still it was uh, Dave Janssen an American with uh, with a Dutch uh, surname mm. um, and as far as, as as far as I'm concerned, uh, he, well, his reconstruction of Grisette was uh, quite faithful, uh, as far as I could tell. Awesome. Uh, and a very a really nice, interesting beer uh, in any case. And Grisette is one of those things that we lump in, in America at least, in like the farmhouse ale, the Cezanne category. But it really is just pretty much always was a commercially produced product, right? Oh, yeah. It was, it was never yeah, like well, a thing. Yeah, yeah. But that um, that is one of the things that that is is very important, of course. That um, basically everything we know about uh, historical beers is is about commercial beer right. brewing, because that's that's a sort of kind of beer brewing that gets recorded in all sort of sources. And if on some farm people were just brewing it for themselves, it leaves very little trace. So you won't find a lot about it mm -hmm. which is right. a, that it, makes also yeah. this subject very uh, di uh, difficult exactly uh, you've got in norway you've got uh Lars Garshall, uh writing about norwegian farm breweries but yeah there's those farms are still there so he just needs to visit them and write about it and, right. and uh, which really fascinating stuff but um for um you know, for belgium and the netherlands we we don't really have those sources if if there is anything to find we just don't really know and this is sort of the the main uh divergent point between your beliefs and, and maybe yvonne or some of the more romantic beliefs right is that they're he's kind of more uh faithful in the oral history of it whereas you're much more academic in your pursuit of what do the books actually tell us were being made is that is that a, a yeah. fair characterization well, uh, for one thing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with with uh, oral history. Right, I wasn't and uh, I know that Ivan de Bats uh, had for uh, those listeners who don't know him, uh, Belgian brewers. Uh, he's a Belgian brewer working in Brussels, uh, making absolutely fantastic uh, beers at the Senna Brewery, um, and he uh, wrote an article about uh, saison history in. Uh, the uh, book Farmhouse Ales. Well, I don't want to interrupt, but I am going to interrupt because I think we're going to get to that yeah. in okay. a moment. Sorry. Yeah, but, exactly. No, okay. but I didn't mean to just, jump ahead. Yeah. If, uh, to give the listeners an idea what the hell we're talking yeah, about. Exactly. So let's let's start from the beginning. Um, can we just have a, a brief discussion um, about what Cezanne is? And I'd love for you to jump all over that, uh, Mike, and also Roel, uh, because I, I'm... I, think they're both probably valid but they're probably not exactly the same so um if either of you uh, or i guess i could go myself would like to just give uh can you like what well i'll start with you roll what to you is saison 
Um, well, let's just get started with where, where the name comes from. Okay. Um, uh, saison is, of course, the French word for season. Um, so it originally was uh, a beer produced in what you would call the good season for brewing, winter. Mm -hmm. So you would brew it in winter and you would drink it later, usually in summer. Um, so that is basically the definition of what the name means. But of course, today, uh, most saisons are just brewed year round and um, probably not kept for, for uh, six months or something like that, but drunk uh, much sooner. But that's how the, um, the style came into being. Um, so today, uh, a saison beer is basically, if it's sort of based on the uh, Belgian traditional uh, saison beers that uh, were still around some 20 to 30 years ago, it's based on that brewing profile or taste profile, then, uh, then you could call it a saison. But um, I think it's uh, now uh, for the brewer to tell us uh, more about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so I, me being someone who's only been alive for about those 30 years uh, and very much read that Fernand Ailes book we were talking about, it, it is kind of that driven by that DuPont style, <clears throat> that Blaugy kind of Wallonian uh, uh, idea of a beer made with a characterful yeast that it tends to be well attenuated um, and often incorporates some sort of non-barley uh, grist um, in a very rough definition of it. Um, and then there's also the romanticism of people apply to it nowadays where it's like the farmhouse ale and there's a whole argument uh, to be had about that and whether or not uh, any of that is true or necessary. But um uh, it has some sort of level of uh, quote-unquote rusticity to it as well, where it's not perfectly clean or perfectly, uh, not that it shouldn't be clean, but there's some sort of, uh, I don't know, something you can, I, I perceive it as something you can kind of grasp onto and hold onto as opposed to like a very slick macro-produced beer. And it's interesting. Um, it, it sounds like Saison, well, whenever I think of Saison, I think of, of definitely a specific profile and style to me it is um without a doubt um uh, belgian not just literally but it fits into the whole profile of many other belgian beers but was that always the case or was it was it really just a a term for beer that was brewed in in the the brewing season uh you know winter brewing saison or or was it always, um, did it always have a, a, a specific style that differed from maybe other beers of the time? Um, do we know anything? Do we have any answers to those, to those yeah. questions? Yeah. Well, um, uh, yeah, we do have the answer to that actually, because, um, if, if you look at, uh, the historical sources, uh, which I did, so I looked at all sorts of books and uh, articles and um, advertisements in newspapers and whatever I could find uh, on the subject. And so you first, uh, you, get, you first, you get in the 18th century in Europe, so in Belgium, in Holland, in uh, England, you get beers that are kept for some time so uh, that's when you really get we brew something in winter and we keep it for a long time maybe sure. even a year or longer mm -hmm. you get really get keeping beers right so um that's in the 18th century you get beers that are called old beer or old brown beer or um uh, provision beer uh, stuff like that and um <clears throat> Uh, uh, you even get like uh, uh, the, the lambics of, of Brussels. They also date from the same uh, period. And actually, saison uh, is is quite late on the scene. The first time that I found any beer called Bière de Saison uh, in French uh, was in uh, 1823 in uh, the city mm. of Liège in uh, in uh, uh, Belgium. And um, in the 19th century, you really see that. Uh, Pierre de Saison is just a very generic term for any beer brewed in season and okay. that you drink later on, usually in summer. Um, so if in uh, the city of Liège you get um, a, a Saison beer, 
it basically is just a keeping version of the beer they already had in that city. In that city. So in uh, yes, you would have uh, uh, the, the simple style of that city was just uh, a, a very peculiar beer, actually, with a lot of spelt malt. Mm -hmm. So you would have spelt malt and unmalted wheat and some um, uh, barley, uh, and they would drink it fresh. And then suddenly uh, they start keeping it, and that becomes the Bière de Saison, the Saison beer of, of Liège. And um, in the 19th century, you get like newspaper advertisement and other mentions of uh, a brun de saison um, or outset de saison. Outset was the beer of the city of uh, Ghent, okay. Flanders. Or you get even you get a grisette de saison. You, you brew oh. a grisette, you keep it keep for it. a half a year or so, and hop, it is a grisette de saison. So it's more. Uh, in the beginning, it's just a term to describe another beer that you keep. And at the Great time, English it was in a way, yeah, yeah. It was it was really interchangeable with uh, you get uh, a beer could be called a beer de saison, but keeping beer could also be called in French a beer de garden, mm -hmm. yeah, which is we now know uh, especially from France, uh, beer de provision, uh, provision beer, or they would just call it old beer. Um, and in, in the beginning, it really describes another beer that they brew, and then uh, they brew it for keeping, uh, they brew it in the, the season, and then it is uh, a, a saison beer. And that, that's what you really find in the 19th century. And basically, if you look at the brewing literature in Belgium at that point, uh, or at newspaper at, uh, at first, or any other sources that well, 95% of the time, if if you get if uh, if you get people talking about the uh, saison beer in a, in uh, in Belgium in the 19th century, it's usually about the saison beer of Liège. So this spelt beer, uh, which is not really like um, the the saison that we know today. Um, I don't think that our modern saison descends from it. Um, mm. But that's the saison they usually talk about in the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, it's, uh, you must, uh, Liège, the city of Liège, Liège is on the other side of Belgium uh, where we um, uh, find uh, Saison today. Uh, so it's, uh, today, uh, the, the, the Pont Brewery is in the province of Hainaut, in the west of Belgium, and Liège is to the east. And there's some considerable distance uh, between uh, the two. And um, it, it really is another region. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, but, yeah, go on, sorry. Um, but yes, and it's, it's really weird that um, you, you just start out looking for uh, Saison beer and you find it in the wrong re uh, region. And right. then worse, after the First World War, uh, a lot of breweries in Belgium modernize and in Liège, they just stop making it. Mm. Interesting. So it, it, just, it just, yeah. The war, like many other things, kind of disrupted um, yeah. so much of that of that part of of the world. Um, it's it, it's fascinating to me. So it it's almost like where and and Mike, please jump in if if you if you you disagree. But just it it sounds like almost there was this style which was more of a well a keeping beer, uh, very much like uh, it, how beers were classified it seems like universally now or or in in europe at the time uh it wasn't just an english thing it was just how you classified uh different beers this one's for keeping this one's for drinking um you know this is a young beer this is right. a keeping beer that yeah. uh died away right. as as it did uh, much slower and not fully in in england but that's not as nearly as popular now and it almost then arose as a completely different style or maybe a sub style or a, a, a variation of that version didn't die. And that became, I guess, the ancestor to, to what we now know. Sure. And I think like when we talk about style, we have to remember a lot of that stuff is kind of ex post facto. Like when they were making these beers, they weren't like, I want to make a X, Y, Z thing that will fit the DJCP guidelines. Mm -hmm. So it was more that like people, you know, grouped things together when they were being produced in certain areas and 
uh, and then the style grew from that rather than from uh, defined like, oh, it should be well attenuated and all that stuff. So um, it is interesting that, to see it migrate and then for it to become the beer that it is now, which it seems to have been something like this since the early 1900s or so. Mm-hmm. Is that roughly where we yeah. see, see yeah. the kind of modern understanding of the pale, attenuated, phenolic beer rise? And I, I also, before oh, uh, sorry, Roll answers it. that, no, I just like to interject and interrupt <laughs> and, and derail things, but it's, uh, it, it is also something that as we do more of these, um, especially with Belgian beer, I get this feeling time and again that these uh, stylistic um, descriptors or definitions are put upon Belgian beer that of all the of if I'm talking about maybe, you know, the big brewing nations of uh, uh, Belgium, uh, Britain and uh, uh, Germany, that the Belgians are the were the least concerned with, um, you know, sticking to a guideline, sticking to a style. Obviously, they wanted to stick to their recipe. But certainly today, you know, uh, kind of the famous quote is, you know, what is Orval? What type of beer is Orval? And the answer is it's Orval. It just is what it is. And the Americans can not <laughs> handle that. We cannot deal with it. We have to define, we have to categorize and define. And I think we took what Michael Jackson, the beer writer, right. you know, would, would try to describe these things to people who've never had them before. And so he had to kind of define them a little bit and invent a little bit. Yeah, it sounds kind of famously, yeah. it kind of just invented a, uh, Right, styles of I've many sour styles, ale. Oh, yeah. and then we took it as the gospel, and right. now we've created right. guidelines according to it, and that just cracks me up. <laughs> how, um, you know, we're just picking a, an example and be like, yeah, that that one over there, that's that's the definitive style, and if you don't brew that, you're not making a saison, and you know, the reality is somebody hypothetically could be like, well, I was making it a hundred years earlier on the other side of the country and it's right. nothing like that. <laughs> you know? So I'm well, sorry, but I, I, I interrupted your, your, your flow. Could you ask the no, question? That again? was more just like, and then when do we see the, uh, the style as we consider it now kind of appear, um, in your research? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say, um, but um, you, you get some brewers in, in uh, the Hainaut pro- province producing something that's called a saison sometimes in the 19th century, but it's not really ever really defined. That, that's the, the weird thing with, with other beer styles. You have Lambic, you have Goes, you have um, Flemish Brown or, or other beer styles that have disappeared. The, you usually find some description of them uh, in uh, brewing literature and of uh, saison in the province of Hena, you get ne- next to nothing. <laughs> um, and so weirdly, one of the um, most telling um, sources on Hena saison is our, our beer labels. There's a fascinating okay. uh, Belgian website r- run by a guy called Jacques Trifin. Uh, who has just uh, collected an amazing uh, amount of, of uh, historical beer labels and he put them all uh, online. And you can just look at those labels and tell from that one, okay, so those breweries were apparently uh, brewing saison at some point. Um, and also uh, you get this, um, uh, especially saison label, uh, labels, oddly, they give a description of the beer. Um, so, um, most of these labels uh, date from after the First World War. So, while well, in Liège the saison disappears, uh, in Hainaut, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, the saison appears. Um, but it appears as a completely different beer. And if you look at those labels, those historical labels from the 1920s and 1930s and, and also the 1950s, uh, they're really weird because the one impression you get from those saison labels is that it's a luxury beer. Mm. That it's 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 all like uh, serve this beer like uh, uh, at room temperature, like a fine wine. It was um, uh, kept in our cellars, uh, served in a basket, 
um, had like you would serve uh, a, a good a lamb, goat. Or goes, yeah. Um, and uh, if from if from what you get from those labels, the image that you get, it's 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 a luxury beer uh, kept in cellars, um, and um, uh, you know w one of their finest beers of such a, a brewery. Um, but that's one of the f few sources where you can actually get a description of those uh, those beers at that time. And um, well, we we have already. Um, I think we mentioned um, Dave Janssen, uh, so the uh, American uh, guy who uh, did all the research on uh, Grisette. He also did some research on uh, on Saison. It's a very uh, interesting website he has. It's, it's called um, uh, Or Category Brewing. Yeah, so it's a French uh, uh, name, so that's why I pronounce it a bit weird. So American um, guy with a Dutch name and a French website. Got it. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, in, in English. Uh, yeah, for, yeah. Uh, luckily for those uh, who are listening. Um, but he also did some research on on, on saison and Bier de Garde, and s to get a general idea of what it must have been like at at the start of the 20th century. And uh, uh, the thing that, that you get from that is that it was basically a sour beer. Uh, it was not uh, 100 miles away from, from a goose. It was not spontaneously fermented as far as we know, but uh, it would have that sour profile uh, that, especially in those days, Belgians uh, enjoyed a lot. And uh, apparently, um, uh, from there, it started evolving so that, especially, I think, after the Second World War, um, it became less sour, hoppier, um, and slowly evolved into uh, the saison as we know it uh, today. And this was primarily in the, uh, is it the region, the uh, Hano, that... Yeah. The, so was this branding of saison as a luxury product was that um was it mostly coming from that region at this point so the uh liege yeah okay or anywhere else okay got it so it really um changed dramatically um i mean i guess maybe you would keep a beer with those properties but um it, it certainly sounds like it's being defined or classified a little bit more maybe because it's just a small region now were these big or small breweries or both at the time making this newer style of saison well uh, i was hoping that you would uh, uh, ask me that question <laughs> because um i did look at that especially because of the uh, whole far farmhouse uh, story that we will still that we are still going to be uh, talking about yeah yeah but i just i i, I found a list of breweries uh, in uh, that particular province, in the province of uh, Enov, in I think, I'll just uh, get it. Uh, um, in 1932, I got a list of the uh, 25 biggest breweries in that particular province, and I just checked um, on that uh, label website do these people also make a saison and of out of the 25 biggest breweries in the province uh, 11 of them uh, made a saison beer at wow. some point judging by the beer labels that you get on uh, Jacques Griffin's uh, website okay and so if, uh, to mention just one if you have uh, the Lion Le Lyon uh, uh, brewery in, uh, in Tournai uh, so they had a um, every year they would have a production well they would use more than 1 million kilograms of malt in their beer uh, and they were making a saison you've got the union wow. um, brewery in Jumet near Charleroi also over uh, a million of kilograms of malt used a year but they also made a saison they also made lots of other beers not only saison but these were really really big enterprises that also made a saison Okay, so these were bigger beers who, bigger breweries who perhaps wanted to put out something, to me it almost looks like how a brewery today would put out something as a flagship, as something special. This is a special yeah. release from this bigger beer, like Goose Island now makes Bourbon County and many other breweries do the, the similar thing. Um, 
very interesting that this is our kind of our, our luxury offering, the one that we kind of hold on to and, and treat more specially yeah. than some of our other beer. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, and they had, they had other, I suppose, luxury beers as well. They would also make uh, uh, some other beers that were considered luxury or were like mm -hmm. Scotch ales. So after the, uh, the British product or something called Christmas ale, which was also mm -hmm. a, a Scottish uh, style beer. Those were also considered luxury products, and and saison was more uh, their. I think maybe their answer even to goats, as far as we know. It's very hard to tell why they produce saison. I I still hope to find some documentation on that. From why do they choose to brew it, and for whom, and what 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 uh, products? What sort of product is it supposed to represent on the market? Wow, um, Mike, I'm gonna ask you to maybe. Uh frame the why don't we get into the um the phil markowski book and stuff like that because i don't think you can really talk about saison too much more if we're ready to get there um without talking about that that book and i think as we talk about it we'll also probably talk about the introduction of saison into america because i think those two are are linked pretty pretty closely mm -hmm. before i say that uh we may have to have a uh, role on Again, because the Christmas beer being a Scotch ale inspired beer <laughs> is blowing my mind. And in hindsight, it makes a lot of so sense. much sense. It makes it, so much sense. I feel like we should do a whole Christmas. It was, it was, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it, it was uh, researching Belgian Christmas beer was just another thing that I was high on my wish list. And um, I, I also uh, made a blog on that on my on my website. So just uh, to a really short history of Christmas beer in Belgium. If you look at the sources that first mentioned Christmas beer, but if you look for sources in Belgium, you have to uh, search in two languages because in Belgium they uh, speak uh, uh, Dutch, mm -hmm. uh, Flemish, uh, and they speak French. So when I was started looking for Christmas beer, I thought I had to uh, search for Kers beer in Dutch or Pierre uh, de Noël in French. Mm -hmm. But lo and behold, the only beers that I find were in English. Okay. At the end of the 19th century in, in Charleroi and other places, you get like advertisements saying Christmas beer in English. So they market it as an English beer. Made, made by a Belgian brewery though. Not an import. At that time, often uh, important from okay. uh, Britain, and very often uh, you will see it is just Scotch ale, so um, pretty heavy uh, brown ale mm -hmm. um, that are just rebranded as Christmas. And you get lots of sources telling you uh, this Christmas beer is a Scotch ale, and that's how Belgian Christmas beer came to in, came into being as an important. Scottish beer that then, of course, uh, Belgian brewers started to imitate themselves. Amazing. Yeah, so, amazing. Which, which also tells you how, how open Belgium was to foreign influences. They copied a lot of British styles, eh? like pale ale, Scotch mm -hmm. ale, or this mm -hmm. Christmassy thing. Uh, a lot of brewers also made stout at some point. It's almost died out now. Uh, and they were also very open to, of course, uh, German style German, beer, yes, to yes. lagers and that sort of stuff. That um, hey, it, 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 Belgium was really a, uh, um, a, a country. Well, they just drank a lot of beer, and they Belgians liked, and they uh, yeah, they liked, and they still like a variation. They like to drink different beers, um, and they have table beers, which is really weak that you can drink during a meal. And you have like really heavy beers that you can uh, drink at the pub or just for yourself or at a party. And you have this entire range of different beers that Belgians really have uh, enjoyed a lot. And that's why there are so many beer styles in Belgium out there. And even then, a lot of beer styles have died out, but they get replaced by newer ones. Uh, and my personal fantasy, uh, my, my personal uh theory is also but i i i really don't have any proof of that and i love it love that's what the show's all that. about <laughs> yeah my personal my personal uh favorite theory is that um the trappist double beers mm -hmm. were also uh modeled after scotch ale that's where my mind was going yeah, as soon as you said that, that they did sense. a lot of scotch ales and and christmas ales 
I was. That's exactly where my mind yeah. was going. Um, exactly when in the in the 1920s, when Scotch ale and Christmas ale and that sort of stuff was really popular in Belgium, that's when the the Trappist monks of the West Mall start brewing uh, th their variation of of double. Uh, very cool. But very that, there, I've no proof of that. Uh, I would love to have uh, have some confirmation of that, but I don't. Well, in the in the you in the American craft brewing tradition. I will say that it is officially <laughs> canon and undisputable that, that that is the case now. Um, well, it is interesting amazing. to think about these things that we think are so canon and so ancient and so old uh, at one time were new, right? And they were right. trying to get some sort of market share. Uh, or may, uh, maybe they just liked those Scottish beers, but it seems like they were trying to get people to drink their version of it. Right. And that, like, it's not like these things were primordial and they came out of the ooze and they've been ma being made right. ever since uh, the dawn of time. Yeah. Completely organic and in a and isolated from from all external influence, you know. Right. Which is yeah. where I think uh, we like, just, yeah. We like with to those, that's, that's another great beer myth, of course, those Belgian Abbey beers. Uh, and what I always ask people is just guess how many uh, monasteries and abbeys there were in Belgium 200 years ago. And no. the, the answer is none. There yeah. were zero. They had yeah. all been yeah. closed during the French Revolution and it would take decades for them to reopen. Uh, and if there was any uh, brewing tradition at monasteries, and there was, but it was not very important uh, to the outside world, um, then it was completely wiped away during those years, and it's only the Trappists that at the end of the 19th century start brewing beers um, uh, that, that uh, really get going, really famous in after 90, 1922 when uh, uh, the double beer of West Mall is born, which is amazing. only 100 years ago now. This yeah, year. only 100. Yeah, but still, I mean, that's because people think of it as ancient history. This might be a good time to talk about the uh, introduction of uh, Cezanne into the American market and how that has kind of changed its, its or uh, affected its uh, perception of the style. Before we do that, um, uh, let's just take like a one or two minute break. I'm going to run to the to the to do something and uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll be. Yes, exactly. Uh, so I'm going to stop recording and we'll come back in like one minute. Okay, and we're we're back. We're talking with uh, is Roll the a, a good pronunciation of your name. I'm, I'm trying to do my my best. Roll. Yeah, it's it's just a, a weird Dutch uh, okay. name. Okay. Roel. 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 Okay. Rule. It's more okay. more like that. Okay. But uh, I'm used to uh, uh, foreign people uh, not really it, knowing how to it. it. Yeah. yeah. I well, my my apologies. So we were just getting yes, to. The um, I think, well, how how the U.S. Uh, has, and I guess the export market maybe broader has kind of affected Cezanne at this point. So we have Cezanne uh, moving from uh, Liege to uh, uh, is it uh, ha 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 Hanoi? Hanoi. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, in in French it just sounds like Eno. And okay. it's, it's, okay. uh, you don't pronounce the H at the beginning and not you don't pronounce the T at the end. <laughs> Got it's it. a French language. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. So like many things, uh, well, like with all beer things in the 19 mid early 1980s, um, things were starting to explode. I think Americans were becoming uh, aware of the, the lack uh, of of well of of diversity and 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 really at that point quality as well i think quality was pretty low even for the big industrials at that time it was kind of a race to the bottom and you started having you know like the the stand-ins that, that we use are, are kind of sierra nevada um but also the imports start to come in as well because you know there was a time where outside of maybe some some fancy German uh, beers, um, no, or, or stuff like Heineken and stuff like that. Specific too. Right, um, that there wasn't a, a lot coming in, and people wanted this stuff. Maybe they had traveled abroad and, and wanted to to get some of these wonderful beers that kind of opened their eyes. Um, and that that's where some uh, two people who I think are just incredibly 
important to uh, beer globally, uh, craft beer globally, but but also, uh, but especially in the United States. And that's uh, Don Feinberg and Wendy Littlefield of Vanberg and DeWolf. Um, they started importing these beers. They were one of the earliest uh, importers of this style of, of, of beer. Uh, I think they started in... Um, early 80s um i think 1982 uh is what yeah. i have down uh when they started bringing in rodenbach uh uh bone lambic uh duval uh stuff like that um and a few years later in 1986 the first saison is imported into the united states and there's i think a good reason why we think of this beer as the archetype um yeah. it's because yeah, it was so the first thing right now yes and that's what we're all drinking right now which is what is it what are we drinking yes. we are of course drinking a saison dupont yeah saison dupont so that was the first to come here and i'll take a sip yeah. mm. S- still the standard bearer i would and say and still <clears throat> absolutely the standard bearer of oh, yeah. of the style um and i think of maybe a few other uh you know, I think people had probably not had many here in the estates uh, had beer like this before. Um, it became quite popular, um, and they, I think, uh, Van Berg and Wolf opened a a brewery, Omagang, in '97, mm-hmm. and it kind of inspired some other breweries. I've got you know Jolly Pumpkin down here as one of the more rustic Belgian inspired yep. breweries that that kind of was the first one of the first to to that space um and right around that same time um ray daniels friend of the show at brewer's publication i believe he was in charge of brewer's publication at the time yep. put out a series of beer uh, about uh belgian uh beer mm-hmm. uh specifically i think that there was one on abbey beers there was pep brew like a monk which is mm-hmm. the abbey beer where there mm-hmm. was wild brews which yep. was the kind of spontaneous lambic, yeah. lambic one there was farmhouse ales yes and farmhouse ales yeah. um and that was the saison uh brewery um and saison and, and beer de garde specifically of what the, yes. that book encompasses Right. Um, and it's funny that it was called Farmhouse Ales because I didn't know this. You have it in our show notes uh, role that Farmhouse Ale was invented as a term invented by Feinberg uh, when he started introducing uh, DuPont. <laughs> um, so if that doesn't show you how DuPont had has cemented. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, me <laughs> either. Um, had had cemented this this idea um, this book, I mean, even today, when I was looking up history of Cezanne, Cezanne history articles about it, I could not find one, a single article that does not reference that book. That book came out in 2004, yeah. Yeah. Farmhouse Sales by Phil Markowski, mm-hmm. uh, still, I believe, the head brewer at Two Roads. Yep. Um, and, uh, and a historical introduction, like an extended introduction by... So the, whole, half, the whole section, like half yeah. the book, is essentially written by Yvonne yeah. Bates. Yeah, um, of uh, De La Seine. And I was drinking earlier. I didn't say it. I was drinking a Terrace Bola from uh, Yvonne. It's a good beer. So, yeah, it's a great beer. So um, yeah. so that's kind of where we are. I would love to um, – uh, not that you have any – you may or may not have any uh, knowledge of it. I mean, that's probably a question for Don, someone I've been – saying I need to get on this show. Uh, this invention of farmhouse ale, do you know anything about the how and why of it or or anything about where this term came from and and, yeah. uh, and why? Well, it is interesting to, to look out at how um, did uh, Saison Dupont end up being important in America. Um, and of course, well, a uh, very important driving factor behind it is, of course, uh, the British beer journalist uh, Michael Jackson, right? Who uh, wrote his uh, well, he first published, uh, I think, in English, it's called the World Guide to Beers mm-hmm. in uh, 1977. Here at the Dutch version of it. Oh yeah. Um, which basically, uh, well, it was a very important publication uh, for. Uh, well, uh, let's say the history of craft beer, because I think it was the first 
important and widely publicized and uh, widely read book um, for beer consumers that really showed the variety of beer styles and beer types around the world. So uh, if you read it, uh, it was also published here in Holland in, the, in 1977. And if you read it you for, for the first time, uh, you would uh, learn that there were beer styles in England or in Germany or in Belgium or in America or, or Scandinavia or wherever. It even has a section on Dutch beer, very short section, of course. Um, and people were certainly were aware of the great variety that was available um, uh, in, in, in all the countries around the world. And um, it didn't start that, um, that, that development you already had uh, in Holland. It started earlier in the 70s, for instance, that you would get pubs that would basically, uh, the people would just drive to Belgium every weekend, buy a lot of beers, take it back to Holland and sell it, sell it in their pubs because people find that Belgian beer so incredibly interesting and so much more variety was available there than was here in Holland. And in England, you had already people of, um, aware of beer history and beer heritage. And um, uh, Michael Jackson basically he, he really wrote the right book at the right moment. And that was a very important thing. And of course, Jackson really was in love with Belgian beer. And he um, next he published a book about Belgian beer only. That was, I think, in the uh, 19... Uh, 92 or something like that but he also played a very important role in uh, getting belgian beers exported because i think if i'm not mistaken it was michael jackson who told dom feinberg you really should check out this little brewery in uh, in the haino mm. province um and it is important i think to stress uh where saison was at that time as i um uh, told you before in the 1930s, there were lots of breweries in Hainaut uh, making uh, this beer style, also big breweries. But by the 1980s, the number of breweries in Belgium had really dim had diminished a lot. I, I think that um, in the 1920s, there were maybe, I, I guess, 2,000 breweries in Belgium. And by 1980, there were 200 left. Still a lot. Right. Still a lot of variety, still a lot of traditional breweries. But really the number had really diminished and if you look at what brewery still existed in Heno, basically only small ones um actually the biggest uh, breweries at the time in Heno were um uh, there was the glen um brewery that just made a lot of upillar pills um and you would have the trappist at shimane were actually quite big um and they would have a lot of small breweries that were still left in the countryside like um, Dupont and, and some other ones. And those small breweries, for some reason, just managed to survive making uh, relatively small amounts of beer. And they were the last breweries still making Saison. So before you had like big breweries and cities brewing Saison as well, but they all went bankrupt or started making other beers. And the more conservative small breweries in the countryside, they were still making Saison. So I just looked up which breweries were still making Saison in the 1980s, where you get Dupont, you get uh, Duboc in uh, Namur province, uh, you had the Vapeur Brewery, mm -hmm. uh, Voisin, Silly, Lefebvre. Um, Lefebvre was actually new making that, and you had Alar Grutenbril that made a Vieille, which is similar. And in the Limburg province, you had Martens making Saisons. But that, that, there, there, that was all that was left. Um, and then Supon, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jackson told Feinberg, you should really check out this small brewery in uh, Hainaut um, because they make absolutely great beers. Uh, and he was right, of course. So Feinberg went to Dupont in, I think, 86 or so. Um, and when he arrived there, actually, the people at Dupont thought, Hey, an American importer, uh, how interesting. Uh, he, he is probably interested in the beer that we sell the most, which was not Saison du Pont, it was right. Monette. Monette, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, which is more like a blonde, Abbey-style sort of beer. Yeah. And it 
still is very important to them. If you have like, I, I was at the uh, Dupont brewery uh, some weeks ago, I just was passing there, I didn't talk to anyone. But um, if you look, they have like a big lorry, a big truck, yeah. and it does not say uh, Saison, it says Moinette. It's still, to them, um, they have a, uh, like a, a big um, glass of beer on, on their outside wall, eh, like a publicity, uh, and it says Moinette. And Moinette is still very important beer to them. But it is um, a more of a blonde beer, a heavier beer, more like an Abbey style beer. And they figured Mr. Feinberg has come to import this. But no, in the end, um, Feinberg said, no, I find your saison so interesting. And that's what he started importing, um, which was, of course, uh, a, a very faithful moment, uh, I suppose. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's what I was thinking. I wonder what would have happened if. I don't know if there's any. It maybe they said no, no. Our number one beer is uh, Moinette. Uh, you should try that first, or something like that. Uh, who knows no. uh, what yeah. would happen to the entire style as we as we know it, or to the style just altogether? Yeah, I mean, it, even still, this was, beer is pretty singular. Like even other saison don't don't necessarily taste exactly like this. So I would imagine that them tasting this, and be like, oh, yeah. no one's making this or anywhere. It, America probably was so, a big driver. This one was, uh, was still uh, on the verge of being extinct in the 1990s. Uh, it did not say it, it was still um, endangered, so to say. But anyway, um, there's this lovely quote by Don Feinberg um, about uh, what he needed to do to get Americans to drink Saison Dupont. Um, and now I'm quoting, I, I think it was on a website where they interviewed him. Um, but I have to look it up where I got it from. But um, then to quote Don Feinberg, um, when I first imported Saison du Pont, beer lovers stateside did not get the brew. Mm -hmm. It was nothing like anything they had been exposed to previously. People ask, is it a wheat beer? Is it a lambic? And I told them it was a hoppy farmhouse ale. Ah. <laughs> End quote. Okay. So to, to get Americans sort of to understand what sort of beer is that is this, he uh, told them it was a, a farmhouse ale. Um, and if you visit the uh, Dupont Brewery, you will see that this, it's located in a very rural place. It's, it's a really a, a small village where they are, Tour. Um, and though they're, they're, they, um, their buildings are, uh, well, not excessively big, but they um, have a lot of uh, buildings. But it's in a really small village, and they have some old buildings. And yeah, you could mistake it for for a farm. And I think at some point they were also still farming, mm -hmm. and so they did combine um, the uh, the enterprise with with uh, some farming at some point. Um, I, I don't know when they stopped doing that. Okay, and was that typical of these uh, of the breweries that were still brewing saison as of the nineteen eighties? Were they brewing, like strictly brewing concerns, or were they, um, you know, brewing was just one of the things that they did to kind of uh, uh, subsist at that time? I, 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 I would find it hard to, to tell you. I just don't know okay. the other breweries well enough. But I think that at least uh, some of them uh, had been connected to a farm, at least at some point previous okay. point or maybe still at that time but you uh, because a lot of belgian breweries um sort of came forth from farming mm -hmm. um if you look at lots of other breweries also bigger ones like bostils that make mm -hmm. um uh, triple carmelite or pollen or um, lots of other breweries actually started out as a farm and then they started brewing beer as well and one of the moments that they did that was the end of the 19th century when there was a uh, agricultural crisis. So they did not get a lot of uh, money from farming, so they had to look at other ways to make money. And that was a moment when uh, at least some farmers um, expanded their farm by also brewing beers. But you must... Um, you mustn't forget that actually when you find such a combination of brewery and farm, it does not mean that this is a small brewery. Um, because um, I actually okay. um, looked it up in um, if like um, a dictionary or 
uh, address guide of, of uh, French and Belgian brewers in, I think, the 1901 or something like that. And the DuPont brewery is actually in there. It was not called okay. that way at uh, that time. DuPont uh, would only take it over the place in 1920. Um, and I have to look it up. What was it called? And because I, if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah, in 19... Uh, 1901, the Rimaud de Redder Brewery in Tours, which we now know as uh, Dupont, they produced no less than 6,500 hectoliters, okay. which is wow. above yeah. average uh, in Belgium of the time. The, uh, the average brewery in Belgium would make 4,500 hectoliters. Okay. So even then, it was uh, actually quite a big larger. enterprise. Yeah. Uh, and they had uh, a steam engine running in a brewery already in the 1860s. Um, uh, so it, it, it was not, not a small affair. It was really a, a serious business, so, even if they were located in a small village, but that's just because they were just close to the consumers, I suppose. So we have, uh, DuPont come into the United States. Um, it inspired, uh, you know, inspired people, we'll say, uh, inspired other uh, saisons, uh, inspired uh, uh, domestic. And then you have this this beer, uh, this beer book come out and a whole section about the history of Cezanne. And, and Mike, can you paraphrase um, at this time, what was this... Um, what was your general feel for what it was? So I don't want to. I don't want to have to put it on you to quote exactly what <laughs> sure. was said. But like, I have a very specific like feel for what I got when I was reading it. Yeah. And what was your your feel for the history and what this beer was historically um, at that time as you were reading it? Like, what was it? Uh, I think it it was kind of posited in that book that it grew out of a beer that would be brewed on a farm uh, to sate the saisonnaires, the, the uh, seasonal workers that would come to the harvest. So they would take their grain and either they would brew it on the farm or at some communal local brewery, and then they would brew it in the winter when they didn't have, the, you know, they couldn't be harvesting or planting uh, in that season, and then they would keep it for the season when the saisonnaires came back. Um, and that it would be some sort of lower ABV, right, yeah. uh, Gatorade, like Gatorade-like yeah, yes, like, yes. uh, way to get potable water and some semblance of calories into people who are working in the hot sun all day. Um, and it was a very romantic picture that was that was Absolutely. painted. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it was romantic, and I think it was it, I think, very uh, effective, makes it seem so calculated. Um, <laughs> well, it, I, I've read... All of those books, and not to disparage any of the other ones, but beer writing, especially ones about like style and then kind of how do you make this, can be dry to say the least. Right. Um, and that was one of the few books. First, also the shortest book, which I think might have had a, a big reason why it had quite an effect on American <laughs> brewers. Is like, oh, I can read that one. I can rip through that. Um, and you can you can read it in a day. Wow. Um, but it was also more much more of a romantic narrative than any of the other books were. And in the, even the Trappist Ales or the Wild Brews, these were more just like, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Whereas this one was kind of more painting a picture of this pastoral life. Um, and yeah. and I know that uh, there might have been, you know, uh, Yvonne has done further research since then, but can you just go back to your reading of, of that and your kind of diving into it and what you first experienced and what, when you read it, uh, Roel, and as you started to dive into the history, what you found about that um, I idyllic, almost fairy tale uh, a history of, of Belgian uh, farmhouse ale. Yeah. Um, well, um, uh, yeah, where to start? <coughs> well, at, at least... Uh, I uh, sort of already told you what uh, the sources that I found were saying. So that's uh, why I find it so um, uh, striking that when I read um, Farmhouse Ales and, and Yvonne de Baat's uh, contribution to it, is that it was so completely different uh, uh, to all the facts 
that I uh, had found already. Um, so basically what I started doing is um, uh, Yvonne de Baart had, had actually convinced the publisher to include all the uh, footnotes mm -hmm. uh, with the um, with the article. They were actually not going to include it, but he said, no, I really want to include uh, the sources where, where I got all this from, which is uh, very commendable. Yeah. Uh, and basically, I started uh, looking up all those sources. So uh, where, where, did, where did he get all this from? And then I realized that very often those sources were just telling a really different story. Um, um, and what happened, I think, um, is that the, the whole uh, a, a story that um, Saison used to be brewed for the, for the Saisonnier, yeah, for the farm workers, um, you don't get it anywhere in any source prior to the 1980s. Um, and it probably originated at Dupont or maybe maybe at, at Brasserie à Vapeur, had a steam brewery, uh, which uh, for those uh, uh, listeners out there uh, really merits a visit, the Brasserie à Vapeur is a steam brewery close by to uh, Dupont and it's absolutely fantastic place. But maybe they spread the story, I, I don't know. It's, um, um, but. That's where this whole narrative for, yeah, in the past, we used to brew this uh, saison for farm workers. That's where it originated. And, and you don't find, hardly find anything in the sources to corroborate that. To corroborate um, that there were beers being brewed for the farm workers at all, or that they had any similarity to what saison is? To what that the to what saison is, and that it even was called saison, what they made for farm workers. You do get... In many regions, also here in Holland, there used to be uh, beer brewed for farm hands. In Holland, you, uh, there was a beer called Hoibau beer, um, hay making beer uh -huh. that was uh, served here in the re region where I live, which was basically just a uh, fairly weak, probably blonde, uh, standard kind of beer. Um, though sometimes here in Holland, people used to brew that at the farm. So beers like that did exist. Of course, if you had people working on your farm in summer, they would get thirsty. And especially in Bel Belgium, the go-to drink to supply to them uh, would be beer. There's no question about that. And um, uh, in Holland, you would have, uh, especially, uh, we'd have this Hoibau beer, which was just fairly uh, standard stuff. In um, Western Flanders, um, a lot of the farm workers would uh, actually drink uh, some version of Outbrein, uh, like mm. Rodenbach, uh, uh, that sort of beers. Um, and the thing is that, um, so at Dupont, they probably were like, yeah, if we're not mistaken, uh, we were supplying Saison to farm hands uh, at the beginning ah. of this century. Uh, and what Ivan de Baats did, among other things, is that he talked to a lot of older or former brewers in that region, which sort of all told that uh, same story. For, uh, uh, when we were young, or maybe our fathers, uh, when they made saison, they sold it to farmers, or there was at least some kind of saison uh, sold to farmers to, who, who would supply it to their um, uh, workers. So there, uh, I have no doubt that there's some truth in that. They um, actually, um, I talked to Yvonne de Baat some weeks ago and um, he thought that I uh, did, um, um, how to say, he thought that I didn't like the fact he had, that he had talked to old brewers. I, um, and I said, no, that was very important that this oral history talking to people that can tell you things that are not in the sources is, 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 is very important. And I would have loved to have actually read more on that um, uh, sort of thing that um, uh, uh, about his interviews with brewers. So uh, undoubtedly, uh, some kind of saison was supplied to farm workers in that particular region uh, about 100 years ago. But um, as we've seen, uh, it's clear that Saison was just a lot more, that there were, was also a luxury version of Saison, or maybe the, the beer supplied to, to farmer hands maybe wasn't called Saison. Um, 
that that's that that's that's a problem that we really would lo love to have more sources on all this. But it's clear that uh, saison used to be a lot more than just some beer from for farmhands uh, right. when they sold it as a luxury right. beer. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, how those like fine wine, that sort of stuff. That undoubtedly was not meant for the farm workers. Okay. Um, and basically, what Ivan de Baats did in 2004 was in that particular article really he was really um, uh, um, uh, motivated to correlate this farmhand story. So he had talked to all the old brewers, um, which is a, a perfectly fine source in its own right. And then he started to look for literature um, that would tell him more about that uh, particular farmhouse variety of saison. And he found, well, basically he did not find a lot. He did find some old books that told uh, uh, him about brewing in the Hainaut province in general, or maybe how uh, they would have make a de Gavre or provision beer in the 19th century. And he basically took some quotes or sentences or little pieces out of that. Um, and then claiming, yeah, these are all books that tell you about how farmers made their beer uh, over 100 years ago. And that's not what those sources tell you. Those are sources talking about professionals making a more luxury kind of beer that is often not even called saison. Uh, they tell you, those there's, there's are all sources talking about brewers um, getting their supplies from elsewhere. They use uh, barley from northern France or Holland or even the, the, the Noob region or Turkey or wherever. Oh, wow. They would use hops from uh, uh, Flanders or England or Popper. Bavaria or whatever. And he sort of did not tell you that uh, that was what uh, those sources were saying. He was just really eager to tell you how did farmers brew, but that's not in those sources. Uh, and uh, Saison was just a lot more than uh, 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 beer for farmhands, but you wouldn't guess that from that particular article. Right. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I'd love to sit down with uh, Yvonne and, and Ray Daniels and maybe talk, I mean, maybe... Who knows? I, I would. Lo it'd be scandalous if he had written that stuff and Ray uh, kind of nudged him to kind of uh, or edited that stuff out or something like that. <laughs> you're you're imposing that on that this conversation. Of course, no, of no. course, that's what I do. No, I mean, it's, but we it's can. Also not not that told me that that the article used to be, was actually a lot longer, and they uh, you really needed to to shorten it for the, yeah, for right. the book. Well, it also, and this isn't uh, an indictment of any of those books out of any of those series, but there's plenty of times where, you know, I read, a, I've been reading books from 2002 that talk to a brewer making a specific style of beer. And they say something that is just categorically false uh, that we know now something about how yeast, how this yeast behaves or how these, how to do this hopping rate. And they're just saying what they did. They're being honest about how they treated these things, but it's just, we know now that's not how that's not the, the way that that works, but they're in these books because at the time that was the, that was, what they knew. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's yeah. like even the same thing as, but it's, it's rampant in uh, a lot of kind of smaller literature like that. Well, one of the, one well, of the, you, you, sorry. You must also think that it's very clear that Ivan de Bas is uh, writing for brewers. Right. So he's really motivated uh, to tell brewers, if you want to brew a saison uh, that is faithful to the original, uh, use this kind of yeast or this kind of uh, barley or whatever. Um, so even if the sources do not tell you a lot, he is still very motivated to tell you at least something, which I can understand. But if I, in the sources, if the sources do not tell me anything about the yeast profile, then uh, I just tell the people that, the, right. that there uh, isn't uh, something about that in the uh, historical sources. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is a delicate point because Ivan de Baas wrote this article in 2004. Um, and I... Um, when I was writing about this and when I researched this, it was in 2018, so 14 years later. Um, and um, so I, I did a fact check. I checked all those sources and I wrote an article about that on my uh, on my website. Um, yeah, plug that. Plug your website very quickly for, for everyone out there because it is English language and it's fascinating if, if anyone wants to go out there yeah, it's and, a great and look website. at it. 
Love, lovebeers.com. Lovebeers. Check it out. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, but there, uh, but I, I, there's one thing that I regret is that I did not send uh, the article to, to Ivan de Baas uh, before publishing it because I did have his um, his email address and we had exchanged some emails. Uh, but I just, uh, I don't know. I think I was impatient, so I just published it. And um, it was a bit um, uh, <laughs> it had some polemic tone about it. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, the whole okay, the whole uh, way I write about it is that I'm I'm actually just pissed off with uh, the right. way he handled his sources, and I was pissed off. But I did not give him the chance to comment uh, before I publish it, and that's what I regret because Ivan the Bats is still very angry with me that I did it that way, and um, uh, I I do blame myself at least for for that part um when but um i i should have handled that that differently i feel now um e- even if um uh, well you, you can judge for yourself about uh, uh what the source that i find um and and uh, the way he wrote about it back in 2004 but that's another thing he wrote that in 2004 and right. even the bass also has continued researching there are now different kinds of sources available because there's a lot more sources that are digitized. Um, so his thoughts on, on what Saison history is also have involved since 2004. And I really attacked him on his 2004 article while, of course, he has also continued his research. So I um, attended a, um, a, a talk by Yvonne de Baat some weeks ago in uh, the Brasserie de la Sambre, where there was a Saison uh, festival. Um, and so there he told him what he knows now about uh, Saison history. Uh, and it was a, a much a wider perspective and that he also acknowledged that you would have these luxury beer uh, labels and that there was a Liège Saison once and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, I, I, I was a bit unfair in my article just attacking him on uh, what he wrote in 2004, even if uh, that article was flawed. Mm-hmm. Right. So it is a bit of a delicate thing. Sure. And, and I, I can't speak to the uh, accuracy of the content. Obviously, I'm no historian um, or, or, and, ha- and have no rigor for those things. But I can say that I've read um, dozens upon dozens of books like that written for brewers and written for specifically those books are written for American brewers to try to understand uh, or recreate or create a product. Um, And there isn't a single one that anyone talks about with any sort of like twinkle in their eye, except for that one. So while the the facts might not have been perfectly straight, it did inspire a lot of people, which, um, you know, yeah. there's something to be said for that. Like no one's, no one's ever talked to me about how great the the Kolsch book was. That it's like equally thin, right? It's like about eighty <laughs> right. eighty pages, but it's just very dry and very straightforward. Right. And um, it, while it's unfortunate that maybe some of that information wasn't the, the whole story of it, I I think that that book has had such a profound effect. And I think for the positive. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. think you're, I, I, and I'm, I think you you were you're agreeing and saying that is, uh, you know, it is an important book. And, um, and even and, though it, you, it you're, you're, yeah, and reading your your posts about that that book and Yvonne's contributions to it, personally, it struck me more as disappointed that that it wasn't correct that that you were kind of let down that your research did not um, uh, uh, kind of jive with that is is kind of. I don't know if uh, hurt my, is probably a, a bit too strong of a word, but that's kind of what, what came across was like, you know, um, yeah, just a, a little bit let down. Not, and maybe the anger came, or you said pissed off, came from that. But that's how it, it read was, yeah. um, you know, this is what I was looking for, and I found something different. And uh, come on, you're, as you said before, you know, uh, Mike, uh, coming for the king, like you're, <laughs> you're the one that everyone was looking to and, and you felt a little let down. And I think that's okay for that to, to come across. And well, I think um, it only makes future books on the subject better. Yeah, right. Exactly. That. Yeah. It, 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 uh, the thing is, uh, uh, often with those, what I call bear myths, because I, I, I also looked at a lot of other of those stories. Also, I like the history of Lambic, or uh, lots of other stories, 
is that um, often the real story is even more interesting than the sort of fake uh, fake version. Right. And it makes usually it makes the real version makes a lot of more sense. Uh, and and <laughs> and those fake ver- those myths, if you read them, there's a lot of stuff you think, yeah, that can be true. Would they supply such a such a great uh, alcoholic beer of six percent? Would they supply that to their farm workers? <laughs> right, right. How, how, how does that add up? And um, uh, and and so you start looking for yeah, um, what's the truth? And then you often find from okay, the the real version of things um, or the well, the, the less fake, um, there's still a lot of the research to do. Um, it just makes a lot uh, more sense. Uh, <clears throat> and But I, I, I agree, a farmhouse also just struck a chord with people. It was uh, once again the right book on the, uh, at the right time that uh, people just love to hear uh, those stories about farms uh, have making their own ingredients and and really people just really uh, l- love uh, all that and uh, it did st- stimulate people worldwide to drink great beer to brew great beer it was it, it was an important publication um, and um, I think th- th- yeah it, it was time that somebody uh, uh, checked all those facts but uh, it, it, that does not uh, mean that um, it was not a very important book that played an important role, and it it just struck a chord with people. So even if it's if it's not really true the way it's written here, if people are making beer on their farm somewhere in America or somewhere else because of these books, yeah, that that's just great. Yeah, I also think that it's an, kind of important to remember that p- people at least in America, tend to think that marketing and branding and that kind of storytelling was invented like in the 50s by slick-talking guys in suits on Madison Avenue. But contextualizing and telling stories about the product you're making has been around forever. So the fact that, like, sure. that this is, the, if you're telling the oral history of these, these guys might truly believe that, you know, this is, yeah, this, and it might be partially, this is a thing that we were, similar to the thing we were making back in the day when they were on farms, but it might not be linearly connected, but it's, it's true enough for us to tell mm-hmm. you that this story is true, and it's a good, good tale. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, it seems that that's a lot of what, what has happened um, but yeah, it's, 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 yeah, there are as you're um, both uh, saying, yeah, there are amazing farm breweries now because of this book. Like Oxbow, I know specifically cites that book and uh, uh, a Wu Tang biography of for starting Oxbow. I know that uh, Scratch cites that book. I know that Hill Farmstead thinks about it, and uh, it's just it's a book that, or, or has read it and is, is connected to it. So it's a book that, uh, yeah, I, it, it 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 served its function for inspiring American or other brewers to create delicious things. Um, hopefully the the revised edition which is long overdue has a little bit more uh more backed up facts and you, you can co-write it yeah maybe you can have the introduction yeah uh, well i i don't think uh, yvonne de bas uh, would like to write an article uh, uh with me um, <laughs> but even if he if he if he would just write a new version uh, it would incorporate a lot of new insights into uh, sense on history and uh, for one thing, Ivan de Baas also wrote a, 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 an article on uh, the history of white beers in a publication about uh, Pierre Salis, uh, the guy who um, uh, uh, invented the Hoogaarde uh, brand uh, and uh, revived white beer. Uh, and Ivan de Baas has written a section on white beers uh, in that in that uh, in that book by. Um, uh, well, I forgot who, who, who was the main author, but that was just a great piece of, of writing. There was nothing wrong with that. So um, I would love to read a new version of Farmhouse Ales uh, with uh, an article by Ivan de Baas in it. And it would uh, probably be uh, a lot better than the current uh, version. Well, I think that might be a, a good time to uh, to wrap it up. I wanted to thank you so much, uh, Roll. Uh, Roll, I can't say it. I, I apologize um, for for spending the time. It, I would... it, it rhymes with fool or stool. Uh, okay, rule, rule. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for for taking the time this uh, for you this this evening. Um, is there anything you would like to say before we uh, we say goodbye? Hopefully not for the last time. I would love to have you back on. This has been incredibly entertaining and informative for me personally. So so thank you. 
yeah, there are still a lot of other uh, uh, European styles, or at least uh, uh, Dutch or uh, Belgian styles that we can uh, can discuss. Um, so uh, basically, in the end, uh, a beer history is interesting and it can be uh, very insightful and important sometimes. But in the end, the most important thing is that you just should enjoy great beer and that beer should unite people and not drive them apart because they are uh, angry over some historical uh, issue. And um, for that, I've been to blame as well. But in the, bot uh, the bottom line is, in the end, uh, beer should unite people. Oh, that's a, Beautiful. A, a great sentiment. Thank you so much, uh, Rule uh, Mulder, for coming on. And uh, we will... Um, I think be back uh, shortly to talk a little bit about maybe more okay. contemporary versions of the style. How the so Americans messed it up. How we <laughs> messed it all up, and that's where you can uh, play uh, front and center, Mike. Perfect. Uh, your, your part in messing everything up. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will be right back, guys, with more of the Beer Temple podcast. And we're back uh, with the Beer Temple podcast. Uh, Mike and I are sitting here in the, uh, the the box room, whatever you want to call it, the back, not the back back room, but not Studio BT, mm -mm. the actual bar. Um, Rare day record. Yeah, day record. So that was pretty. We we've so that was we've, very cool. Yeah, we we just got done with uh, talking to Rule, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, very cool. Yeah, um, I remember reading uh, those articles when they came out in 2018. Actually, now that we okay. Uh, reread them and it being like kind of like this is blasphemy but also right. then reading it and being like yeah, it makes a lot of sense and like uh yeah and just like uh, reiterating that while it, it was directionally correct enough you know and inspired enough other breweries that while it might not be an academic paper it is it served its purpose and more which is kind of something we're, we're going to branch this into right is the yes the effect, the effect of of, of of DuPont and that book and, an and all of that. American production of things in that family. Yes. More or less, right? Yeah. So I think, yeah, where we've kind of left is, is the history of, of Cezanne, how that came to the U S maybe how that was originally marketed, how that, why it was marketed that way, perhaps um, some of the, the story and the folklore uh, the realities that are were behind that, um, and now I think we should talk about maybe the effects that that some of those that some of that that has has had, um, and and I mentioned, um, and we really do have to get Don Feinberg on yeah. on this show. Um, I. Uh, just the kind of the the singular importance that, that he has had on, or the, both him and his wife uh, Wendy have had. On They're very wonderful people. I've met them. They uh, very they nice came people. into West Lakeview when I worked there. I didn't know who they were, mm -hmm. and I tried to like not a hard sell, but like really talked up lambics. Like then they had first started blending that. Like, oh, tell and me. Then oh, like, lambic. Yeah, okay, yeah. The the uh, with the X, mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> they were like looking at me like kind of like. Incre not like it was like very pl pleased but like kind of like what what are you doing mm -hmm. and i was like all right whatever and i just like went back to behind the register and christina came down and talked to them and they came back like we're gonna buy this but we want you to have it because you did such a good job talking about it and i'm like what why would you care they're like well we own the, the distributor yeah. the importer and i'm like oh okay yeah, i yeah, helped that, blend makes, it. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah they're like you were right about everything it just was funny you tried to sell it to us that's great <laughs> like, no, that's like, probably exactly like ideally what they would would love to have have happened yeah, they also gave me a gold star ah perfect yeah, pretty cool. oh <laughs> named you the the handsomest boy in school yeah, yeah. um that's when no that was my mom oh i'm sorry that's <laughs> when she came in um so here we are um the book has has come out um yeah yeah and and so, like, one of the reasons Phil Markovsky was tapped to write that book, because I think he is, was winning many awards as the brewer at Southampton on Long right. Island, which was, like, one of the only places making Saison. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing to think about is that, like, no, like, these books were read by, you know, they were, 
it was what 19 2004 so there was a few thousand breweries and a, a smaller subset of that right. in america were reading these books and i don't think they ever intended or knew it was going to blow up in quite the way it did um but there weren't that many commercial examples being made in america like at that point it was them and uh uh, obviously, Dupont was here, but there were Omegang, oh oh which God. is also you know Van Bergen right. DeWolf. Right. Um, they they started that. Uh, maybe New Belgium yeah. had uh, some maybe, stuff going on maybe. at that time. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember in those books what they saved for the wild brewing one and what was in the the farmhouse mm-hmm. sales one. Sometimes they would blur together as as the styles sometimes do. Right. Right. And like what was yeah what what was being made uh, domestically. Probably again, uh, some pretty small brewery. I mean, Southampton was a small brewery. Yeah, right. It was a brew pub. Yeah, yeah. And um, somewhat interestingly, there was almost no discussion of uh, mixed culture brewing in the farmhouse ale book. There's, it's mentioned that Britannomyces would be in it, or that some of the beers that were made in this way would be tart. But it wasn't like a, and here's how to make a barrel aged acidic saison. Because I think didn't that didn't exist really at that time. Right. Right, exactly. Uh, and so I think you have on here that in 2000, around this time, just when Jolly Pumpkin pumpkin opened, right? Right. Um, and I'm looking, I thought I had written somewhere in the notes, um, but I don't think uh, it, it might not be on here anymore. Um, you know, there was, was talk about, you know, um, what was a, you know, domestic versus what was a, a wild uh, culture. Sure. Um, and I mean, Cezanne brewing was, um, yeah, it was somewhere in, in the middle. And I think, uh, some of the, I, and I, I do think that even the early examples were kind of toying with that. I think some of the early, um, examples of, of Cezanne obviously was Amagang. Um, but, but even we talk about Jolly Pumpkin being so old, almost like, not almost, but like just a, so ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, they came out in 2004 as well. I mean, that's yep. when they opened. They opened the same year as this Farmhouse Ales book. Right. Um, so, I mean, this stuff did not happen that long ago. I was shocked. I was looking up Tank 7, which I think of as like the archetype for the um, <laughs> the American Saison of that era. For sure, which is hilarious because... Yeah. Not, not with anything that any other brewery recognizes as a Saison yeast. Really high in alcohol, really un, un, under attenuated for the other examples in the style. So not sharing most of what mm-hmm. everyone else is like, this is what makes Saison. Did have Brett in it. Some of it did. Yeah. Saison Brett, which is a, a fantastic beer, it's more attenuated. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's an interesting that that's the one that like kind of became one of the only, you know, commercial examples you can get. Right. Uh, and wasn't packaged until 2009. Uh, wow. That blew my mind. That yeah, that it seems like something that they were making in the 90s. I mean, they may have been, uh, but it would not have been packaged. Yeah. They did not. It was. They said they'd been making it early on, long ago, but it really had not. That it was not packaged until 2009, and it it went crazy. Um, probably one of the first. Um, um, times experiences that that people have had in the u.s certainly in the midwest with a farmhouse ale if they yeah. weren't drinking probably way before they'd had dupont they were more likely to have uh boulevard tank seven yeah i would imagine so yeah um which is a uh but it is something interesting that so that that beer is called tank seven and the story is that they would make it in a bunch of different tanks before it was called tank seven and then the specific geometry of one tank led to better results, which is mm. something that is known, these yeasts are known for doing, like the, the the DuPont square shallow fermenters, like that idea of like you treat your yeast this way, which is probably somewhat true for all yeast, that certain right. geometries benefit their specific character, but something that has been almost completely removed from American commercial brewing. 99.9% of breweries yep. are brewing all of the, all the styles in tall cylindroconical tanks. The taller, the better, baby. Yeah, yeah you the can more fit you more can in a square. Fit more in, which is you know terrible for a lot of the expressions of these yeasts, specifically ones that you want specific characteristics out yeah. of. Uh, but it's bad for every yeast. Doesn't no yeast likes that environment or thrives in that environment. You find ways around it. You pitch more. You aerate in certain. But you 
It's not what these yeasts want to do, and it's not that these yeasts notoriously, specifically DuPont yeast, doesn't behave correctly in that environment. So most people it just doesn't attenuate the same rate. Yeah, but you have to do a lot of different things. I remember, um, and I, I've told that's the, by now, people know that I'm just going to retell the same stories. But <laughs> it is funny; people uh, laugh at my, you know, uh, fanboyism of of Trumer Pills. And I've met the, I think I met the brewer once. I might have met him twice, but I think it's once, and within a few minutes of meeting him, I was uh, getting in a disagreement with him. You were disagreeing with him. Over tank geometry. Yeah. Me, mm-hmm. the total jackass, <laughs> total jackass. Uh, Sergio, you have to dip, bleep that Yeah, out. I don't know. Do you have to do that, jackass? Um, oh, it means donkey. Yeah, exactly. Uh, with a, a, a brewer of a award-winning um, a pilsner, and in a, in a large industrial uh, a brew house, um, but but he was, and I think we were maybe in hindsight talking about maybe different things. But I was saying that um, you know, are we losing beer culture? Are we losing something by having everything be in cylinder conicals? Because uh, I had just gotten back from England mm-hmm. and uh, realized that these breweries with these types of fermenters were were dying out. The open um, top. Yeah, the because shower. even there, the newer ones were, you know, going cylinder conical. Yeah. And he was like, no, cylinder conical is good because it's, you know, you get this r- repeatable process and you can, you know, it's this is what you want. Right. And, and this from and his that. perspective, that's correct. Right. Right. And from your perspective, who, who uh, you it's want like, the I don't want, I don't, yeah, I, I don't want this to You don't want all of die. your beer to be like that. Right. I think it's, it, I think it is probably correct to, to say that most beer should be like that. Most beer should be controlled and prudent like in, in a relatively repeatable environment. But there also should be breweries that don't do that. Yeah. And, and another, just a uh, sidebar off of this, the Britannomyces that is so associated with Saison and specifically now American Saison, that's like the barrel-aged versions of it, is actually a British thing. Mm-hmm. And it is not at all a, a wild yeast. Mm-hmm. It basically only lives in places that make alcohol and goat farms for some reason. Okay. Like it's not like if you go into a wild capture, it's pretty unlikely you have actually captured any Britannomyces. Okay. You most likely have captured wild Saccharomyces that has is phenotypically similar to Britannomyces. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but so like, but, but you know, coming from Lambic and people yeah. analyzing that, when they look at it, they're like, well, the, all these Saccharomyces species are essentially the same genetically, but these Britannomyces are weird. So it's got to be those that are doing it. But it's then there is Britannomyces in those beers, but it is very much more likely that it's a, a weird Saccharomyces. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think aside. getting, yeah, no, it was a good aside though. So getting back to where we're at with Saison uh, in the U.S., I yeah. think. Um, so where, where, where we last tangented was Jolly Pumpkin. Jolly Pumpkin, exists. I think, and Tank 7. Tank 7. So we're at, Tank seven, we're at right. 09. Which is like a kind of a different lane. Yes. There are some of those. But I think Jolly Pumpkin is spurred. Yes. Way more. Right. Uh, uh, or inspired way more breweries to brew in that style, just because probably because Tank Seven was such the behemoth and took up all the space it needed to on its own, right? Yeah, I think like the Tank Seven was probably more similar to the maybe farmhouse sales of Alma Gang and even Dupont than the Jolly Pumpkin saisons or farmhouse sales were because they were yep. tart, they were funky. Yep. Um, so All oak fermented like. right uh so then the, a year after tank seven is bottled um is an i would say an, a very important year in in farmhouse ale in america uh that's 2010 and that's when hill farmstead opens yeah in in vermont and I'm not saying they were the first, but like you have to have signifiers in these hot take history. We're very much on the hot take side now. Okay, <laughs> rules gone. It is hot take time. These are piping hot takes. Yeah, we'll we're send them an edit without this part. Exactly. <laughs> just so we won't fact check us and shame right. us on the internet. Um, but I think it can be a stand-in if it isn't actually singular. Right. Um, and to me, just tasting it, 
uh, undoubtedly inspired by some of the Cezanne that came from Belgium that followed in the footsteps of Cezanne. Now we're talking about right. stuff like Blaugy. Phantom is the one. I mean, right, to me, right. Phantom and, and, and Cezanne DuPont are so, to me, obviously connected, and, and, and one is such an inspiration for for the other, and I'm not saying that Phantom was inspired by uh, Hill Farm, uh, just FYI, in case you guys didn't pick up on it. Um, uh, so, and I think they were both, um, I think they were probably, like, Blaugy obviously ha- was hugely influential as well. They've brewed a beer together, which they still make. But that's like a, and, and that's maybe my favorite brewery in the world, but that's certainly in the vein of DuPont, right? Yeah. Whereas Phantom is... Right, um, like the like the Orval, it says it's Phantom, and 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 nothing. Yeah. So when you had when I had Phantom, I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? This stuff is fantastic. It's 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 just so complex and just a little, a little bit sick. tart, yeah. and it's weird. And, and then you had another one. And you're like, what? The f- yeah. That? What is this? <laughs> and I mean, I think I got into Phantom when it was like in a really hitting. high spot. Yeah. It was same. really hitting really really well, and I would have bottles even then. Um, where they would be fine, but then every fourth would be just this magical, or maybe fifth or whatever it was would be magical. Yeah. Um, and Which, it wanted you like I want I have to get it again because I have to recreate that spe- experience right. again. I've got to get a like a just an amazing bottle of this stuff. And feeds into like the romanticism of this style, right? That the right. story is being told oh, is very pastoral and romantic. But then that idea of like just this crazy guy doing right. all the beer himself. He doesn't even really drink beer. He just kind of drinks soda and doesn't like, tell but anybody what's in his he beers. Might not really, no. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but then you have one. You're like, what? How did you right. do this? Yeah. Um, so so cool. And, and I think that is the um, that was was influential. Um, and and there was an element of Phantom's uh, flavor profile in and and Dupont as well, frankly, in Hill Farmstead, where you would have these saisons that were so simple in that it was maybe one type of yeast, one type of malt, and maybe you know one or two or what I don't know how many types of uh, 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 hops were were in there. And just this absolutely in, incredible depth of flavor that came from something so simple. Yeah. Um, still, to me, I, I would. I mean, if you had to pin me down, uh, the best saison brewer in my mind in in the world, I think is is Hill Farmstead. To me, I just love it. I Sitting mean, right here, Chris. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Um, They've ha- they've got you know they've got twelve year or ten years on you <laughs> right right um, so I was joking. yeah so and and then you have I think an explosion of that style saison yes. which I think we are still living in and I think it's been mutated and yeah. well it became it bastardized went from being, a bit it kind of. Uh, yeah, definitely mutated into something that went from being like Saison into just being American sour ale. Right. Which became something kind of different that I don't, I don't really always associate with the thing what we're talking about. Right. But like there was a period where everything needed to be more sour and everything, even, even, even people that were trying to not make it more sour right. just got more sour. Um, and and who knows how why it drifted? I mean, we, right, we've right, gone right. into Untapped in in the past about how that could have sure slowly, slow, or, right, exactly, or, or just that's the the first time that a lot of breweries are dealing with this. And as we said, there's not a lot of literature like on how to technically manage this part, this type of brewing. Um, so mixed cultures, if you just start with one mixed culture, it uh, it's going to evolve and change and certain organisms are going to outcompete other ones in your mixed culture. So it's not like you're, you know, it's not like getting a single strain of yeast where it's going to be this, if you pitch it at the same rate, it's going to mm-hmm. be the same every time. So sometimes these cultures would shift and, and drift right. and become more sour into themselves. And if all you had was that mixed culture with nothing to blend it back with, then you made more acidic beer over time. Yeah. And, um, and it is funny because in, in you know, it's 20. 20- 22 Hill Farmstead opened in 2010. And I remember the first time I ever 
heard of the brewery was on a cheese show where a guy was like going all over the country eating cheese and he was in Vermont and he went to Hill Farmstead. Where were you watching this show? I think it was on like uh, public a- uh, uh, um, like uh, public television somewhere. Awesome. Um, I could still remember the, I could probably find it. But anyway, he goes there and it was small tanks. It was like the size of the tanks yeah, roughly like that like um, Pipework started out with. Yeah, seven and 10 million Yeah, tanks. so little, little tanks. Um, and uh, Sean Hill was was there. He was on the 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 farm. Um, maybe I know they used you know they washed their cheeses. Jasper Hill was right down the street, and they washed their their rinds or used to in Hill mm-hmm. Farmstead beer. I remember he took a bunch of the, I think it was spent, the hop stuff, and grabbed. And he's like, well, this is the hops. He's like, can I eat it? And he's like, ah, it's not going to taste good. Sean said, and the guy ate some of crying. that green. No, it was hops. Oh yeah, Ugh. and the guy was like immediately like gagged it back out. We got to find like this. That. I yeah. can't believe that made the edit of this show. I know that's awesome. I know, um, and that's how I remember it anyway. Maybe it was suspend grain, but that wouldn't be gross. I mean, this it I, just tastes like nothing. Yeah, I think it was, it was the green out. clumps of hops that are left over. Huh. Um, so he was yeah sitting there on the farm. Uh, so but but so Hill Farms that didn't become this big thing for a few years after that maybe sure. two years let's say i don't know maybe yeah, one year it took him a while yeah i know <laughs> guy um and now i really think that style or or what people perceive to be at the heart of that style is still at for beer geeks what they think of as farmhouse ale if you yeah. say i am a farmhouse ale brewery here is one of my farmhouse ales to the average craft beer lover. Mm-hmm. They're they going to expect, expect it to be sour. Yeah. They're going to expect absolutely. it to be sour, um, which wasn't necessarily the case of early Har- Hill Farmstead. That's not where I'm trying to go with. Right. But and, and still isn't necessarily the case with a lot of those beers. And you go yeah. think of they're not rippingly sour. Some of them aren't at all. Anna yeah. is, is Anna sour at all? I don't uh, know. There's, it's, uh, it's lower Maybe pH, lower than, pH. Regular, than, than, your, than your lager would be. But right. It's not sour. Most of those things aren't sour. No. Um, And so I think that's kind of, to me, where we're at and have been for a couple years. I'm not, I think there's one more chapter still to be told, but would you agree with that, that like the mass of, of what farmhouse beer is considered certainly in in america or let's say craft circles yeah, yeah. so that would be non-traditional belgian breweries yeah. regardless of where they're actually what, what country they're actually brewing in because there's a bunch in canada there's a bunch in scandinavia and stuff right. like that um, well scandinavia yeah. has become, it's become its own different thing well that's like, true like farmhouse brewing there uh but yeah i absolutely would think that i think that that's that's true like now i run a saison brewery and the vast majority of our beers are not acidic at all. Well, that's where I was going as like, I think it's interesting. I think is, was, is now playing a role in the, what may be the next chapter I hope is, which is domestic, like classic Saison. Because I, I talked to Sean Hill about what would you call this style? We are trying to put a name to it Mm -hmm. and i think like neo farmhouse ales i think is something that like Uh, he was just saying we should just call it ale like it should just be beer right (laughs) Uh, yeah but then we were we were like (laughs) i think you know 100 percent of your beer out of your own tap room you can just call it whatever you want (laughs) but he was saying maybe neo farmhouse or maybe neo classical saison or something like like that um and i think that's a great way to to put it but now i think we're getting into like maybe like postmodern saison i sure. don't know I, I, you know I, postmodern is a tough term because it's so uh loaded with pretentiousness but you know, right right i am who i am but i think that that is probably true that 
I, the, for me at least, I make saisons that are inspired by things other than just that I walked in the woods or like, which are, don't get me wrong, breweries that I, <laughs> I love very much do that. And that's a wonderful way to do it. You got a problem people but, walk in the woods? But no, we okay. don't use the term farmhouse ale because those breweries you want to stake claim to it because I don't do that. Uh, I make beer, right. like the, my, our yeasts, most, for the most part, start as commercial pitches of yeast. I'm buying grain from a small grain producer, but it's still like I'm not malting anything i'm not growing anything myself let's be real oh, hardly any of anybody is but that kind of eth it's it's a mashing together of the ethos of that the integrity that is presented by farmhouse ale and the a, a desire to innovate that is american brewing mm -hmm. so I, we're somewhere in between those two um and in partially intentionally so partially because that's what I find really interesting. And I think there's a lot of space in there. Um, don't come fill it up for me and make this more hard, make this more difficult than it is for me. But, uh, you know, I, it's kind of, I, I view it, what I'm doing as an extension of this in my own little way that uh, I use yeast that are more expressive. I use the eat like this kind of desire to create something that is, as I was talking about at the beginning of this episode, uh, well attenuated, characterful, driven by the character of its yeast, um, typically using some sort of non-barley grain to in, in, uh, imbue some flavor, some body, and some mouthfeel. But also using, you know, we use some modern hops. We use uh, like basil and things that aren't typically used in, mm -hmm. in or wouldn't be used in Belgium. Um, but also, like I was saying, when reading those books where you look at something and you're like, that's factually incorrect about how this yeast behaves. Mm -hmm. Trying to bring all the knowledge we have, at least that I have accrued or uh, gotten making other styles of beer at Pipeworks or talking to other people and applying it to that world. Right. Um, and to do so, a hybrid of what would have been traditional and what was, what should have been strived for and, and what is the next thing that, what, what pushes this forward. And I'm not saying I'm necessarily doing it, but that's constantly at the top of top of mind. That's awesome. And sometimes that's using old techniques mm -hmm. and sometimes it's using new techniques and sometimes mm -hmm. it's using things that, are can canonical and sometimes it's doing things that aren't um but uh it's something that i, I love very dearly and I, I like to i'm hoping i'm finding a little of my own space in it that's awesome and it's also i i, I hope that it's like listening to uh rule talk about um his uh historic saison who was making it where it was being made how it was being marketed maybe why it was being marketed that way um to feel like you're very much in the tradition if you are trying something new or trying to see if, hey, I wonder if people will respond to this even though it isn't, um, you know, in, uh, you know, the Mad Fermentationist's blog or, I mean, I'm just picking somebody. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, you know, still very much in the tradition really of all beer, but right, also... Right, right. Um, but also Cezanne as well to, uh, to, to try different things to be, um, yeah, I, I mean, even, uh, marketing, um, uh, their, their beers. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, like it, that is part of this, right? Right. That is part of like, even somewhere like, uh, I mean, it's, it's to be, to be very authentic is in part your the marketing and, and most places doing things like this are aware that their authenticity is part of their brand and their marketing mm -hmm. which is this weird kind of like uh ouroboros eating its tail of like are you no longer authentic if you're aware that like trying to be authentic about things is uh, is part of what attracts people to you um but well, i think that you just yeah. don't need to navel gaze that too hard on it because i spent a lot of time yeah. being like how do i how do you do this effectively without it seeming false well also and uh, you just don't give a shit about yeah, it yeah. the best way so there's there's this thing it's it's also interesting when you when you say that because also your and so many others concept of authenticity of this style of beer right. may not be authentic. So right, right. like it's so funny that it's it's just become abstracted now, which does not make the authenticity any less authentic or or real. Um, because once it's been, you know, generally agreed upon, uh, you know, defined in a certain way, okay, then I'm authentic to this definition of it. Or, but or it's just, just funny if that's kind of an abstract or was created for 
maybe authentic, uh, uh, authentic authenticity at heart, but not really of actuality. If that makes sure. any sense, well, it's just so you can just go yeah. so deep into that. If you're going to try to define that by like the actual specs of the thing you end up making, you're just picking a point in time to be authentic to, right? Right. Where it's like, if you want to make your beer, it's authentic for you to make your beer taste like Cezanne DuPont. You're just picking a specific point in time when it that beer tastes yeah. like that. Or if you if you think it's more authentic to do all your fermentation in barrels with mixed culture, that's just a different time. If you really want to, if you want to like go all the way back, you're like, Really, if you want to be super authentic to beer brewing in that sense, we all should just be making mush, mushy smoked gruets. Right. Like, right. Like, yeah, exactly. Weird, weird beers that no one wants to actually buy from you. Uh, if you if you want to go all the way back to the first beer, and that's the only true authentic thing. So I think it's more of an authenticity to your your opinion of it and your beliefs. Yeah. And, to, and, and it's a communication mm-hmm. to people that this is truly almost everyone I've met that focuses on brewing this style. Part of it is that this is coming from a very absolutely personal and honest place absolutely i would say more than any other style of beer yeah farmhouse ales um trademarked on feinberg um <laughs> are it's <are, laughs> a perfect little thing to put in the middle yeah, of that right. sentence <laughs> um are 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 more um careful or more interested in showing their intent to the drinker than, um, you know, many, maybe sour producers as well. But yeah. I mean, um, and, but you're a hundred percent right. I mean, being authentic, you can be authentic to whatever you, you want. I guess it's more when you're start to say that, uh, you are doing it inauthentically, um, is when you can get yourself into trouble. You may not be wrong because they may just be doing it, um, you know, just for purely marketing. But then I guess the funny thing is a person who was doing that probably wouldn't do this, but someone like Rule could come in and be like, well, technically, uh, that authentic version that you're talking about was actually inspired by these people who were completely marketing driven. Right, <laughs> right, right. It's like, right. you know, they were making smooge, right. and that's who inspired uh, Cezanne Dupont. They were, they were just trying to make a smooge beer. Right. Um, and God forbid, in 50 years, like, you know, the next... Uh, you know, Hill Farmstead is going to be inspired by smooge. a botched version or a botched vision of what Smooge had been or 450 North. <laughs> right. no. And that it, this is to say that there are certainly people that making other styles of beer that are as passionate and as earnest. It's just that uh, there's a high percentage of the people making the Cezanne that are hearts are that or philosophically driven or like. For <laughs> sure. So, uh, and that book has to have a lot to yeah, do with it. How so, could it not? So I mean, yeah, how could that one style attract a t- flavor of beer attract s- like uh, a s- like an ethos more than other types it, it seems uh, impossible no uh, yeah it it's hard it uh, you know of course you want the book to be technically accurate and historically accurate but you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater like we were talking about earlier where like the the way that was written and the passion with which it was obviously written was so rare in those books and still is so rare in most like most mm-hmm. brewing or even beer related books period even if they're narratives that like a certain type of person read that and was like awesome like this is this is uh unlike anything else i've read even in these this belgian series right it's very different th- it was very different than reading any of the german like style books because those right. were just like here's the facts and here's where it was made right and, and they had the history of that right 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 they, they, they could go and make these and are the, the brewing records made them from do it the, this way right then they made them do it that way and right. then they said you have to use hops and then they said you had to do this you know so, so people that for whom beer is a true attempt to express something personal this laid a lot of groundwork to allow that right whereas if you if you if you don't do certain things you didn't make a pilsner right Mm -hmm. you made a lager you made your version of a lager but you didn't make x what like uh, you didn't make a hellas if you don't do these things so and you like or you didn't make a british pale ale if you don't do these things so that i don't want to ramble on yeah forever no no i wasn't i mean because i i i I guess I do want to, but I don't want to. But now I'm just thinking, like, in it, it, we've done a couple of these, um, like the history of German Germanic styles, uh, the history of of Belgian styles, and the history of English styles is where almost all of this, almost 
is going to come back to yep. one of those three regions, 90 plus percent. And the probably le- the least um, uh, broadly um, recorded, certainly in English language, is the Belgian stuff. Yep. And I'm curious if that is why we have uh, taken that uh, void, that vacuum, and used it to insert all the passion and stuff that we want to be true because we can't be proven wrong. Right. You know, there wasn't these like not. well-documented yeah. giant, the largest brewery in the world was coming out of, you know, uh, England at the time right. and, and stuff like that. And while they were certainly industrialized nation, they, it wasn't, it doesn't seem to have been quite to the intensity of you know, the English vats that were, you could throw dinner parties in or the right. German precision of you. And, uh, I'm sure you, there was great apprenticeship programs and things like that, but it wasn't a school like in Germany where you, it was a career path that you could still go down and you like, there are people in Germany that don't drink beer that yeah. you know, are professional brewers. I mean, right. there's people all over the country, like all over the world like that. But, um, because they went to, they are literal they're, they're brew masters. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And like we, that doesn't seem to be the story about Belgium. That's one of the funny. That's one of the things I love because the more you about these shows is the more you talk about it, the more things kind of open up as like a possibility that just seem to maybe make sense. And time and again, when there's this incredibly romantic story, mm-hmm. it is at least partially not all the way true <laughs> sure and well no story is all the way true right right <laughs> is mis- misremembered or intentionally changed but like, so many of the belgian ones from yeah they're Pierre, from the wit beer yeah. to lambic the history of lambic to um Cezanne, uh to uh you know all those kind of uh wild ales trappist breweries i mean yeah. these monks you know making Zero the beer Travis breweries 200 years ago right <laughs> Um, you know, it's just like steeped in this small beer loving tradition. Yeah. Um, you know, not necessarily like Stella, the giant <laughs> beer, largest beer concern in the world. Right. Uh, coming out of there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, prove me wrong, everybody, uh, that, that, that maybe is why there's so much of this, uh, romanticism tied into Belgian beer is because it's kind of like a, well, I haven't read anything that says it's wrong and I want this to be true so badly. Yeah. Uh, a very much an American craft beer thing. Like we want sure. this to be the uh, most authentic thing. thing that you want. Yeah. You want to believe those types of romantic stories. Well, that's my story and I'm, I'm sticking to it. Uh, do we want to talk about the curious case of the French Cezanne yeast? Oh, that's right. That One other one. myth that I wanted to talk about, and this is another thing that I've brought up a few times on the show, was um, so in in the, the research that I was doing for this show, there were articles talking about Cezanne, and there would be paragraphs dedicated to French Cezanne. And it would be like the same, like almost written like the same way every time you kept seeing it. It was all coming from the same source material. Yeah. And it was French Saison, drier, highly attenuated. Like, um, and this one was even about how to brew it. Like why yeast had cultivated this and this is where you could get it and stuff like that. It and does. I remember first getting into it, uh, I like I thought I was starting to learn something. When I was like, well, you know, there's actually two types of Saison. There's the Belgian Saison, then there's the French Saison. Right. Um, and Very then Jacksonian in its right. uh, uh, exactly. unnecessary delineation. And then having Thierry A for the first time and being like, well, this is the source. Like DuPont's the source for the Belgian. Yeah. Uh, so all those yeasts that you're getting banked, they're all, they've all been cultured, propped up from DuPont. The and this one... 11 is is coming from Thierry A. Um, and just, you know, one of the cool things about, like, I think we had talked about in maybe the, the cool experiences, I don't know if I included this one, was when I went to Thierry A and ended up having, like, breakfast at his table, yeah. at his kitchen table with him because um, so I didn't cool. have anywhere to stay. And he's like, you want to stay in my house? And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so I was having, like, you know, marmalade and toast and coffee while he was, like, reading the, the morning newspaper. I thought you had, like, chocolate and cigarettes and Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. Well, he's right over the border. Right. Um, <laughs> so we were, I was talking to him about, like, so tell me about this, like, French Cezanne yeast. You know, like, you're the creator of it. And he was talking about how we went to 
brewing school in Belgium, and they had a yeast library there like all brewing schools do, and he wanted to brew uh, Cezanne, so he picked the, he picked several of the yeasts and tried it, and that was the yeast he liked the most, and that's the one he's been using. And I was like, he's like, yeah, so it's from Belgium. And I was like, so it's not like a, it's not like this. So that farmhouse yeast isn't like the, the French style. He's like, well, first of all, I never said this was French saison. Second of all, that's not my yeast. Like they may have gotten from a bottle, they might have propped it up from a bottle of my beer, but like that is not my yeast. If you brew with it, um, and I mean, he what was like, say. he was not upset in either way, but he right. was like, people are saying it. You have never heard me say that this is French Saison or, right. or anything like that, which, um, you know, that's, that's, you have to be pretty deep in, in, in beer geekery to have heard of this French Saison thing. But, um, I mean, I, I remember selling people bottles of beer being like, oh, this is French Saison. This is where it originates from. And then it all just being like, no, it's just a different Belgian yeast strain, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, then you go like, as we talk about, say, uh, style being applied after the fact that style can be, well, in this region, they might use the same ingredients, but it comes out differently because it was a different technique or right. attenuates more. But like, say, Saison has become so specifically tied to like, you use this type of yeast, which doesn't have to be true. Right. Um, it just is a, the easiest marker for us to wrap our heads around. And it could easily have been just picking a different Saison brewery and being like, ah, this is the, you know, pick whatever town they're from. Like, where's Blaugy from? Like, whatever town they're from. Right. Like, oh, this is the that style. This yeah. is what the Saison tasted like in this region. It's Blaugy. Uh, and it's like, well, no, it's just that one singular example and their one singular house yeast, which is exactly what Thierry was. Yeah, and, and, and in reading some more recent stuff with Yvonne, one of his things he's on now is, like, trying to dispel the myth of this specific type of yeast being used for farmhouse brewing all the time or right. Saison brewing all the time. Right. Where he's like, no, it was like what they had and they would be, it would differ from place to place. It wouldn't all be this like phenolic, uh, stat one positive or diastatic, uh, yeast. It was, it was different in different places. Very cool. Yeah. It's very cool. Uh, also when you get to the end of these episodes that it really just opens up more doors. I mean, of, of all the, the, the hot take histories we've done, this is the one that kind of just is, uh, ends in a very happy, <laughs> I don't know, like yeah. it's, it's, we'll see where it goes, but yeah. it's this make, kind of cool thing. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, anything else you want to say before we get out of here, Mr. Shalau? No, this is fun. Yeah. Well, I agree. This was a great episode. We might have to break it up into two parts. We'll, we'll see yeah. how, how long it, it went. It probably um, could be longer too. And pro- oh my gosh. Um, it could be, we'll but go full Rogan on this one. We, um, well, I want to I want to thank all you guys. Please, uh, the the letters, uh, the e letters, and the actual letters have been slowing down. It's probably because I haven't been um, asking enough. But if there's anything that you guys have liked about this show in the past or would like to hear more of, um, let us know. It's insiders at craftbeertemple dot com, and that's in the show notes. We're gonna have a bunch of stuff in the show notes this episode if I remember to put this stuff in. <laughs> um, but hey, I mean, how about thanks to uh, to Rule uh, Mulder for for coming on? Ooh. I mean, yeah, yeah, Rule is great. Sorry. Um, all right, guys. Well, that's about it. We will see you next time with the Beer Temple podcast. And so long. Wait, let me see. I have to be surge now. But so long. Yep. Oh, wait, I messed it up. Push the fade. Right. There you go. There we go. <laughs> all right. Well, got it. Nailed it. See you, everyone. Again, again, again Remember this is what we want